September 8, 2014, meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. At this moment, I would like to turn the proceedings over to the town clerk, who is going to administer several oaths of office. Thank you. If Mrs. Powers could join me in front, and then we'll administer the oath for Mrs. Grennan and Mrs. Ray. Congratulations and welcome. Could we please have the roll call? Councilor Sullivan? Here. Councilor Grennan? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor McCausland? Here. Councilor Ray? Here. Councilor Wagner? Present. And Councilor Walsh? Here. Pledge please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Yes, Kathy. <laughs> Councilor Ray. Yes. This is my chance. Um, first of all, I would like to recognize, on behalf of the entire council, the tireless leadership and dedication that Jessica Sullivan has given to the community of Cape Elizabeth. I know I speak for all of us on the council when I say thank you for a job well done. And we have a little gift for you. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Council Ray and everyone. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to say a few words. First of all, uh, regarding a, a, a recent event and accident, the accident at the transfer station was a terrible tragedy for the Denison family and for the town. I know I speak for the entire town council when I express our very deep sympathy to the Denison family and to all who had known Herb Dennison for so long. I would also like to express our gratitude for the unwavering professionalism of our town staff during the event's incredibly difficult challenges. And now I'd like to go on to say a few words about the 2014 Town Council. 
We are elected to do the people's business, which is a great honor and a privilege. I would like to commend the 2014 Town Council for what I believe is one of the most productive council years in recent memory. We completed almost 100% of our 2014 goals. I'd like to mention the highlights and focus on several first ever achievements. The Ralph Gould Award was given to two outstanding citizens for their contributions to our community, Michael Duddy and David Weatherby. We also gave the Boston Post Cane to George Baker at age 101, the town's oldest citizen. Roads have been paved, Spurwink Avenue, Charles Jordan Road, and the outer parts of Route 77. We adopted a Greenbelt plan. We amended our zoning ordinance to redefine the normal high water mark at the highest astronomical tide plus three feet. This will provide consistency and objective measurability for years to come, giving our citizens and code enforcement officer clarity. We adopted a town center plan. We dealt with smoking at Fort Williams. We formed a 250th anniversary committee, which is planning wonderful events for the town's 200th anniversary birthday party on November 1, 2014, 15. <laughs> We updated the Municipal Capital Stewardship Plan for fiscal years 2016 through, two, I'm sorry, 2016 through 2025, and we created a five-year financial forecast. We refinanced school department debt, saving the schools over $300,000 in the next 10 years. And for a list of the first ever achievements for the town of Cape Elizabeth, we formed a first ever Senior Citizens Advisory Commission. We adopted the first ever Shooting Range Ordinance and Firing Range Committee. We signed a first ever agreement with the Cape Elizabeth Historical Society. We received for the first time ever a AAA municipal rating from Standard & Poor's. We adopted the first ever Code of Ethics for town councilors. And lastly, this is not exactly a first, but lastly, after years of review, study and thousands of hours of work by many of you here, a successful library vote took place in, in November. Private fundraising has been underway and continues to be extremely successful. Cape Elizabeth will finally have a new and renovated library for all ages to use and enjoy. I'd like to thank my fellow counselors, our outstanding staff, and our dedicated citizens for everyone's achieve, uh, efforts and all these achievements. Thank you. Um, our next, um, are there any other reports and correspondence from any other counselors? I, I know that Mark Dennison is here and maybe if we, he, I know he wanted to say something so I think it might be appropriate to go directly to that. Okay, we're going to go to our citizen opportunity for discussion items not on the agenda, Mr. Dennison. Please. Yep. A few people that don't know, my name's Mark Dennison. I'm the middle child of Herb Dennison. And I'm here on behalf of my family tonight, my mother, Kathy, my older brother, Herbert Dennison Sr., and my sister, Karen Dennison Janelle. We've gone through a very tragic time in the last two weeks. We've been dealt one hell of a blow, to put it blunt. The icing on the cake was my mother's only last sibling of seven of her family passed away that night after my dad passed away at 10.30 that morning. But the main reason we're here tonight is a couple of things. First is, like you said, Chairman, recognition is well deserved here and I want to take a minute to talk about some people that work for the town of Cape Elizabeth. I'm going to start with Mary because she's a female. Mary became the very good friends with my Aunt Jane, which was my father's sister, who lived the third house back from Two Lights parking lot. And this was back when Mary was working at Rudy's. And since my dad's father passed away, Mary has always been like a little hen to my Aunt Jane until she passed away. So the family knew of Mary long before she became a town employee. And the only thing I can ask today is, is have some patience up there because Mary is struggling with his death just as hard as I am. So a little extra patience up there. The next person I'd like to talk about is Chief Williams. I take my hat off to that man. He handled that job 
with the best he could possibly do with under the circumstances. And I want to relate to him coming down and continuing the investigation because we went from a tragic death to a crime scene at the transfer station in a matter of moments up there. And I take my hat off to him. He had to come down and interview me and my mom and the professionalism of the way that man handled himself. And his final finale with me was the funeral possession. He would not go on his vacation with his wife like the rest of the, my members of my family had requested. That that's what my dad would have wanted was him to go on vacation. He uprooted his fa family vacation because he felt he needed to be in the feudal possession and lead the feudal possession. And I just want you guys to know how much I'm meant to be in my family. The next person I want to recognize is Peter Gleason. Peter Gleason is just what this town needed after Phil McGoodrick retired. He's been doing an outstanding job. I apologize. I don't know if he's here tonight, but I probably dropped the F-bomb on him up at the dump because I needed a few minutes to try and pay my last respects to my dad if I could down in that dumpster. <laughs> and he was yelling for me to get out, which was his job, but I needed that extra minute and he gave me it. And I just can't thank him enough. <laughs> the third person I need to talk about is Bob Malley. <laughs> Bob Malley and my father have had a long, long relationship. If you ask Bob today, Bob will tell you that my dad taught him everything he knows, and he's proud of that. But I just wanted to share with you his final thing that really touched my heart. My, like I told you, my mom's sister died. She had one child. That child didn't get here for all of this funeral stuff until Wednesday night at around 11 o'clock during the snowstorm. He wanted to go see where my dad's grave was going to be in Riverside. So we were out riding around, taking care of my dad's plowing, taking care of my plowing. And we swung into Riverside Cemetery at just about midnight, only to see Bob Malley personally in the town of Cape Elizabeth pickup plowing that cemetery to make sure my dad could be buried on Saturday. And it meant so much to me. And I just want you guys to know how good of a staff you have and appreciate what they go through, because they are sensational. The last thing I want to touch on is my youngest son. My youngest son, Josh, works for the town of Cape Elizabeth in public works. I got the call. I had some good moments with my dad in the last five years. I was always over there every morning to have coffee with him, and we called the kitchen table the round table because there was more business solved at that kitchen table over the years than probably this town hall has had solved. But I got the opportunity that morning to have my morning coffee with dad and to make sure he was doing all right. We went out the door at the same time. He went to the dump. I was headed to work, and I got as far as Pickett Street when my brother was calling me on the phone, telling me that he thinks his dad had a tragic accident up at the dump and to get up there as soon as I could. I got up there expecting to see my dad had been involved in a bad car accident. Wouldn't have been a bit surprised because of my dad's age that it might have even been his fault but I was never anticipating to see what I found up there. And I had two things on my mind. One, to, to talk, say something to my dad if, if it was as bad as it was, and two was to try and shield my son from seeing any more than he needed to see. My son was born, I call him my miracle child. He was born with a heart problem at birth. He was un undergoing emergency heart operation 18 hours after he was born. He's had three more heart surgeries, the last one, he has just been to work approximately one month since the operation. So I'm just asking if you can bear with him and help him through this because he is struggling very hard. The last thing I want to touch on is I spent a lot of time in the last two weeks between Gulf Crest Field and Riverside Cemetery. I can't get any closer than Gulf Crest Field to where the accident happened. I cannot handle the transfer station. But all I'm asking is, is I've been doing some serious thinking. And I think the way the dump is running right now, it cannot run that way anymore. It's not safe. I understand that the gate has been mended, but that's not the answer. I understand that we can't shut the dump right down and not have anybody dumped here because we need to dump our trash. But I spent some time thinking, I know you have uh, engineers involved in it, and I'm glad to see that Mike's right on top of it by moving it to 2014 study and, and we're moving forward with it. But some quick suggestions is, is I see two problems up there at that transfer station. One is where you dump the household trash, the problem that we ran into with my dad and losing his life. But the second bottleneck you have up there is your uh, 
swap shop. Both excellent things. But in my opinion, we need to move that swap shop out of there and move it over to where, like maybe the old sand pile, the summer sand pile used to be, to get that congestion part out of there as a quick fix. You wouldn't have to spend big money. That building's on a slab up there. All we'd have to do is pour another slab, and we could drag that whole thing right over and mount it right on a new slab over there with little, little cost. A temporary Band-Aid as far as disposing household trash, we don't use Gulf Crest Field much in the winter other than people going in and doing some walking around the field. You could set temporary dumpsters in place like you had to the day that my dad passed away to keep the dump operating. Over there, you could bring your household trash customers in there instead of coming in Denison Drive, they'd be coming in Gulf, Gulf Crest Field Drive. Then you could take those dumpsters and dump them back into the transfer compactor and have it go into the tractor trailer so it's still feasible. Then that would cut any vehicle traffic right now over there dumping into that hopper other than a one-ton truck or a dump truck trying to dump into that hopper because they have household trash that they're hauling. Just suggestions. I understand that you're going to form a committee. I'd be interested in being on that committee and representing my dad. I've worked with my hands my entire life, and if I can help you guys, I want to because that's what my dad would want. And let it be a lesson. Unfortunately, my dad lost his life, but we need to address this as soon as possible up there. Mike, I think my uh, tonnage on waste disposal might be down a little bit right now for you because I can't handle the dump and I'm taking my trash and my son's trash elsewhere. But please, revisit the safety up there because you've mended the gate, but you've done nothing else for safety barriers up there. I understand we can't do things overnight, but I'm just real uncomfortable. I don't ever want to see a resident or a business owner go through what me and Josh went through two weeks ago today. Thank you for your time and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other citizen that would like to speak to an item that is not on tonight's agenda? Could we have a finance committee report? Jessica, I, I don't have a finance committee. Um, the report there is uh, attached to today's uh, agenda is 27 pages of financial information and I'm working with Scott and with uh, Michael to come up with what we would call a dashboard to be used for financial reporting in the future. My hope is that at the January meeting we'll start that process. Um, I think that if we can uh, boil it all down into something that's a little more understandable and something that we can all uh, look at and uh, and understand what the key elements are of our performance year to date and what the, what the issues are maybe going forward. But uh, Scott's willing to work on this and so is uh, Mike McGovern. And I look forward to having something of substance to uh, share with the council in January. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, town manager's monthly report. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chairman Sullivan. I, I just, you know, want to as well express my sympathies to the Denison family. Uh, you know, I think it is pr pretty evident from the news accounts and otherwise, you know, the Denisons have had a long-term relationship with the community that, you know, goes beyond, you know, Herb uh, just serving as a director of public works. Uh, he hired, you know, quite a few of the people he was involved in my initial hiring in uh, 1978. Uh, when he was the acting town manager, he hired Bob Malley, hired Forrest King, our, our parks foreman, and, you know, so many others who, you know, have worked for the town for, for many years. So, you know, this was a, just a terrible tragedy, you know, most affecting the, the Denison family. But, you know, in, in, you know, I think, it, you know, as you alluded to, Jessica, it, it, it also, you know, has had an impact and effect on, on everyone else. And I think, you know, I think Mark hit it as a as well, you know, his, his point that, you know, people feel very uncomfortable at the transfer station now. Uh, you know, so this really affects the whole community. You know, I think anyone feels uncomfortable going to a location where something tragic happened. But, you know, also, you know, I think everyone, you know, going there, you know, could feel, you know, uh, you know it, it, it happened to someone and, you know, it could have happened to anyone. Uh, you know, it, the woman who you know, was, was driving. Uh, you know, she's also going through a very tough time. Uh, you know, we, we think of her, of her as well. Uh, you know, we do need to make some changes there. Uh, we indicated in September 
that we thought the congestion was was getting difficult, everyone sort of freelancing, doing their own thing, which is, you know, I'm not blaming, that's not what caused this accident, but at the same time, you know, just the, the it's another one of the ironies of this whole thing, is that, you know, just after having commented on some of the issues there that, that, that this terrible thing happened, you know, I think Mark's comment about the swap shop, you know, that, that is another thing, it, everyone's parked all over the place, uh, you know, everyone loves it, but at the same time, in, in a practical sense, it, it doesn't really work that well. And, you know, I think, you know, so many of these things we need to, we need to look at, you know, the, the, the longer term of, uh, you know, how everything's going to work. And I think that's what, you know, it's important that we have this committee uh, that's proposed and, and we get on with, with making improvements. We have hired a, a uh, consultant, Wooded and Curran has been mentioned, uh, you know, unfortunately, this is in the middle of all sorts of other work and commitments they've scheduled, and we, we don't expect a, a, a real re written report from them until December 22nd. Uh, so, you know, we hope everyone is patient, and I think, you know, as Mark said, you know, everyone needs to slow down a little bit. Uh, you know, it, it's just, you know, even, you know, coming into the dumpsters here, we see, people go racing in this driveway. Uh, you know, and every, you know, people are backing up, and, you know, it's, there's just so many of these things that I think, you know, people just, everyone moves too fast these days. And, you know, usually everything is fine with that, but then you get a tragic accident like this, and I just think it, it ought to serve as a reminder. The, the other thing I just want to close with, on the, the, the part of, about Herb, uh, you know, he, he worked here at a different time. You know, Mark mentioned about people going to the, their kitchen and a lot of decisions being made around that table. You know, I, there used to be a restaurant called the Carriage Trade, which is down where the, uh, the good table now is. And they had a lunch counter in there on the right as you went in. And Herb used to go there almost every day back when he was the public works director. And he'd meet his father, Rocky, his sister, Jane. And, you know, other people would be there. And uh, I remember John Marshall, who probably not too many people remember, lived down on Surfside, where we had some other issues of late, and he, he was down there but every morning. But it was just, you know, things were a slower pace of life then. You didn't have the emails, you didn't have, uh, you know, the, the constant, you didn't have voicemail back then. Uh, it, and, you know, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a nice time, and, you know, you, you just met nice people, and Herbie was one of those persons. Uh, he gave an, an awful lot to the town, and, you know, to, to have had his life ended the way it did, just, you know, just everything about it seemed wrong. Uh, so I think, you know, we need to buckle down and get, get things back together and, you know, and I, and I do, you know, I, I was doing rotary work in Manila when this happened and, you know, to, to have gotten that phone call over there from Matt Sturgis who was in charge, but, you know, over the next few days, that later that day, or it was night for me, but day here to, to talk to uh, Peter Gleason and, and Matt and, and Bob Malley. Uh, and, you know, everyone really, it was, it was difficult, but they, they acted with professionalism and, uh, you know, I'll forever appreciate all that they did and, uh, you know, all that they, they had to deal with. And, uh, you know, again, I just can't imagine, knowing what it's like for the town staff that's involved, I just can't imagine what this is like for the Denison family. Uh, the other thing I did want to say is that, you know, with, with all of the, the focus on Herb, we also lost another department head this past month, uh, George Rallis, who was the Thomas Moyer Library Director for about 13 years, immediately preceding uh, Jay Sherma. And he, he, also, he, was the, he was responsible for the last library renovation uh, back in 1986 and helped move that along. But George, George was a very interesting person, had very strong views on a whole lot of topics, but you know he really moved the library along into a into a new new era, uh, you know, of, of bringing in you know more professionalism, and uh, you know it, it's uh, he'll be missed. His, his wife Nancy, some of you may know, was a longtime teacher in in the, the Cape School system, but uh, you know it was it was just it was just a tough month. And then you know to read about Chief Justice McCusick you know, also passing away in the last few days, who lived down on Shore Road for, I don't know, 25, 30 years or more, and, uh, you know, was just a, you know, a, an excellent representative of our community. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's tough. It's, you know, I, 
on the, the one hand tonight, you know, we have new counselors and, you know, we highlighting the, yeah, but the, the juxtaposition of it all is, you know, it's just a little awkward, but, you know, I, I do wish the, the new leaders well. I wish, uh, welcome, uh, Patty, to the council. You're, you're replacing a, a good person, uh, rather than a Miss David, but I uh, know you'll do a great job. So, anyway, Jessica enjoyed working with you this past year, and I know you're not moving far on, on, along the table, uh, but, uh, you know, we will get through all this, and uh, you know, I think the council, as the, you've begun to lay out goals for the next year, it looks like we'll have a productive year, and uh, you know, we we look for everyone's cooperation as we sort through issues and move ahead. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> next item is a review of the draft minutes of October 6, 2014, and November 6, 2014. Is there a motion to accept the minutes of October 6, 2014 and October, I'm sorry, November 6, 2014? Councilor Ray? So moved. Is there a second? Councilor McCausland? Any discussion? Errors? Omissions? All those in favor? It's unanimous. <laughs> Item number one, 2015, the election of town council chair. The caucus recommends Catherine and Ray, and I would like to um, take, I guess, executive privilege of the outgoing chairman to nominate Catherine Ray for the 2015 Cape Elizabeth Town Council Chairman. Is there a second? Mike. I'll second that. Oh. <laughs> okay. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Congratulations. Grab your name tag. Yep. Uh, Whoops. Oops. Oops. Go blind. There go. Making noise. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> Wait, I, first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome Patty to the town council. I'm sure you'll find it very interesting. A lot of fun people to work with and interesting issues. Um, second of all, I'd just like to say a couple words. Um, I'm honored to be reelected to the town council, and even more so to be elected chair. I thank the other councilors for that honor. My parents moved to Cape Elizabeth in 1959 when I was a baby, and I grew up in Cape Elizabeth, as well as my husband and daughter. Years later, when I became interested in genealogy, I realized my Cape Elizabeth roots went back much farther. Reverend Robert Jordan, who was born in 1611 in England and died in 1679 in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, was established on <coughs> Richmond Island in about 1641 as an Episcopal minister. He married Sarah Winter and had six sons. He was my ninth great-grandfather. So I'm especially honored to serve Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Okay, we will move along to um, item 2-2015, Adoption of Town Council Rules. I believe you received a copy of these in your packet. So I would entertain a motion uh, to approve them. I'll move. Thank you. Councillor Sullivan. Seconded. Thank you. Councillor Wash. Is there any uh, changes, errors, omissions, um, discussion? No? All in favor? Any opposed? No? Nope. Great. All right. Uh, moving on to item 3 2015 appointment of the Finance Committee. Um, as per the caucus, um, Jim Walsh has been um, nominated, and I would um, ask for a motion um, to approve Jim Walsh as chairman. So moved. Councillor Sullivan, is there a second? Second. Thank you. Councillor Wagner, um, any discussion? No? All in favor? Any opposed? No? Okay. 
Um, moving on to item 4-2015, appointment of an ordinance committee. Um, the caucus proposed <coughs> Councillor Wagner as chairman and uh, Councillor Jordan and Councillor Sullivan as members. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Is there a second? <laughs> Thank you, <coughs> Councillor McCausland. Any discussion? All in favor? No opposed? All right. I'll, I'll keep going. <laughs> um, item 5-2015, appointment, appointment of an appointments committee. Um, per the caucus, caucus uh, Councillor McCausland has been um, proposed as chairman, and Councillor Grennan and Councillor Walsh as members. Um, is there a motion? So moved. Councillor Sullivan, thank you. Is there a second? Councillor Jordan, thank you. Any discussion? No. All in favor? Any opposed? No. Okay. So the next uh, moving on is we're going to the consent agenda, which means that we'll be taking items 6 through 17 on block. Is there any um, councillor that wishes to take any of those items out? No. All right, then. Um, this, there's a whole laundry list, as you have on your agenda. Is there a motion to accept the consent agenda? So moved. Councillor Walsh, is there a second? Councillor Grennan, yes. Okay. Um, any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Any opposed? No. All right, so. Flipping around to a couple pages. Um, I guess then we go to item 18-2015. Um, this is the Proputic Club Beverage License. Um, there's a draft motion there. Um, would someone like to make that? Councilor Walsh? Um, I just, that's just a point of order. Um, yes. I am a member of the Proputic Club and would like to disclose <coughs> that as we consider this item on our agenda. Okay. Chairman Ray, yes. I am also a member of the Puda Club, and I would like to disclose that. All right. As well. Do any councillors have an issue with that? No? All right. Seeing none, I will then um, entertain a motion. Would someone like to make a motion? Oh my yes, <laughs> Councillor Jordan, thank you. Motion to approve. Do you want me to read the motion to grant the approvals of the Malt Venus Spirits Liquor License and Special Amusement Permit for the Perbuda Club? Thank you, Councillor Jordan. Is there a second? Councillor McCausland? Okay. Um, any discussion? Yeah. I, I just wanted to point out that this, this is a little bit different from the annual. Uh, permit for the Perpuda Club in that before it was only for the, for the premises with the clubhouse and now they're also planning to have a mobile carts where as you've seen in some golf tournaments and other things where they actually bring uh, malts, vinous and spiritus uh, products uh, out on the golf course and uh, serve them. It's fairly typical in other golf courses and uh, particularly for tournaments and Perpuda Club is planning to do this as well and that's part of the permit as well. Thank you. Will, will it have a tap handle like in Rodney Dangerfield's bag? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to add anything? No? Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? No? Okay. Uh, moving on then to the public hearing on the proposed school bond. Um, I guess then I would open up the public hearing. Would that be correct, Mike? Yep. All right. Public hearing is open. If anyone wants to speak to us about the proposed school bond, please come up to the um, podium, give your name and address, and you have three minutes. Councillor Sullivan, will you help me with the three minutes? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Gross from 7 Seaview Avenue, and I'm, uh, I have some handouts. Uh, four pages of handouts that I'm referring to in my uh, the reasons why I'm asking you to vote against this proposal. I'd like to hand them out. 
Also, if anyone in the, in the audience wants to see those four sheets, As I said, the, uh, the school board is proposing a, uh, the, to have the, uh, to have the uh, town council approve a $1.7 million bond as part of the funding for the 10-year $11.7 million capital improvement plan for the sc entire school system. And I'm asking that the town council vote against this request from the school board for two reasons. Uh, number one, I don't think it's necessary to issue uh, any bond in order to fund uh, part of that $11.7 million 10-year plan. I believe that the entire $11.7 million can be funded merely from the, purely from the savings on the debt service that we're going to undergo during the next 10 years. And the second reason um, against uh, having the town council approve this is I don't like the idea of a of a $1.7 million bond being broken into a smaller number, uh, 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 multiple projects. Each of project is below the limit for asking the voters to give an approval to a bond. I would much prefer that uh, if we're going to issue a bond and the total is $1.7 million, that the, it go out to the, the citizens and taxpayers and then we get a chance to vote yes or no. I know it's legal to do it, but I, uh, I don't like that concept. Um, now, I am not at all against the, the school board is proposing to spend $11.7 million to, uh, for capital improvement program to, to essentially maintain our, our school campus and the plant of our school system. And, and I don't dispute a single dollar of the $11.7 million. I think the school board has done a terrific job and they've gone and looked out over a 10 year period looked at the entire campus, all of the facilities, and said, here's what we need to do over 10 years, and they've come up with a total of $11.7 million. I don't dispute a single dollar of that. What I dispute is the way the school board has chosen to fund the $11.7 million. Now, if you look at Exhibit E1 that I handed out to you, what this merely is, is taking the $1.7 million of the bond and plugging it into an Excel spreadsheet. And you can see it's spread over 20 years. And you can see that the first column is the interest payment each year. The second column is the principal payment. And the, the third column is the total of the two. And I'll direct your attention to the bottom of, of the interest, pay, interest payment column. And that total is $825,000. And so if, as I propose, it is possible to fund the $11.7 million and not issue a $1.7 million bond, then if, that, if my proposal is true, then this $825,000 over 20 years is completely wasted. Not a penny of that will go to the school. It's just interest paid back to the bank. Mr. Gross, could you um, wind it up? Because your three minutes is sorry, I couldn't quite hear your three minutes is up. Would you please finish up? All right. Uh, uh, on number two, if you just look at number two, this is essentially coming from the school board budget, and what this shows is for each year from 2014 to 2030, uh, what the, the current debt service is in the budget, and the second column under column C. That's saying, comparing the debt service each year with a debt service in 2014. And you will note that the, the debt service increase, the, the savings on debt service increases each year. And if you look at column D, that's the cumulative saving for, for each year. And if you go from 2014 down to 2028, you'll see that the total savings just from the debt service line on the on the school budget is $12 million. And that's what I'm proposing. We, we, we fund, use that $12 million to fund the $11.7 million the school board's asking for. And the, the, pro, the, the penalty we pay is it'll take 14 years instead of 10 years. And, if, and the amount we spend each year is column C, which means we would spend less money in the early years and spend more money in the late, later years. Thank you, Mr. Gross. Thank you. Is there anyone else? No? 
Seeing none, then I close the public hearing. Thank you very much. Okay, um, moving on to item 19-2015, the council consideration of the proposed school bond. I believe we are expecting a presentation. Yes, um, Council Walsh. Chairman Ray, we are expecting uh, Michael Moore, who is the chairman of the finance committee for the school board, uh, has asked to address the council. I ask Michael to come forward. And I believe the superintendent of schools has got the technical aspect of that presentation in her hand. We're on standby. Yeah, oh, there you are. We're on standby. Okay, there we go. Uh, thanks, Bill, for uh, speaking out. And uh, thank you for raising some of those points. Um, I'd like to thank on the behalf of the school board for uh, having the time to briefly go through um, a lot of the material you've received and rather than do a PowerPoint, I'll just go through the presentation you've received and some of the major points. Um, first of all, the school board capital improvement process is that it's a process. Uh, in October 2011, we formed a building and grounds committee and, uh, and over through the three year planning process, um, included all stakeholders, teachers, students, citizens, uh, the town council and a joint workshop, finance committee, the school board, and a res result of that planning process uh, was the, is the bond request before you tonight. Uh, the bond funding rationale, and I think some of this would address some of the questions raised by the citizen. Uh, first, bond funding promotes prudent sharing of capital investment costs between current taxpayers or users of assets and future taxpayers as the cost of those projects are spread out over a 20-year period. Uh, two, and this would address the strategy of using bond funding by matching the life of an asset, such as a 25-year roof, to the funding, such as a 25-year bond. The funds are available to meet future capital maintenance needs as those assets appreciate and the related bond matures. And lastly, uh, especially in light of what's happened over the last few years in terms of capital projects, uh, bond funding used in moderation reduces the annual tax impact and budget volatility compared to funding all the projects to the annual CIP operating budget. Uh, we wish we could move out roofing projects another 14 years, but unfortunately, as we've learned, you can't. There is an impact to not maintaining roofs. You get water damage. Um, so uh, while we can reduce tax volatility, if you were to do $1.75 in projects through the school budget, that alone would be close to a 7% tax increase, tax increase, a 7% tax increase on a citizen, and we think bond funding should definitely be used to reduce that impact. Uh, the bond proposal is $1.75 million. It's composed of five discrete projects. There's been no change in the amount or the projects, and the average age of the asset being replaced is over 25 years old. These are not replacing assets of five to 10 years. The range goes from around 25 years to some of the assets being replaced are over 40 years old. Uh, the category details, I won't go through them. You have received supporting documentation for each project. We've also made that supporting documentation available to the public through the school board website. Uh, the initial estimate um, when we did it was a 4% interest rate, which would be an approximately 42 cents per week on the median home. Uh, we would like to take credit for this, but we can't. Uh, interest rates have come down. Using a 2.57% interest rate, which is the rate used in the library project analysis, the average cost would be 38 cents per week on the median home. So on the slides that were presented by the citizen, those in interest costs are actually going to be around $280,000 lower, uh, meaning that the average interest expense would be $23,000 per year. Lastly, um, we are planning to use some of the upcoming retirement debt services. Um, so we expect, or it's projected over the next three years, that the estimated school CIP related budget expenditures, which would be interest and principal payments and funding projects through the budget would be flat. So given the fact there are debt retirements, the hope is for school 
budget spending for CIP only, we can maintain that at a flat level over the next three years while at the same time addressing some significant capital improvement needs. And the last slide is, uh, I'll read these, capital maintenance needs and scheduled projects. All of these are supported by external analysis and internal analysis. The bond proposal reflects lengthy, detailed planning process. Bond funding uh, proposal and the CIP plan are consistent with community expectations of maintaining what we already have and school board stewardship principles of balancing the tax impact of current tax holders and future tax holders. So that is it. I'll be happy to address um, any questions the council may have. Do any councilors have questions, Mr. Moore? I just, um, I don't know whether Mike, Michael really doesn't necessarily need to answer this, but Mike McGovern can. Uh, addressing Mr. Gross's um, point about uh, not liking, even though it is legal to do so, uh, not liking the fact that we're bundling all of these together into a single $1.7 million total, they are individual projects. I don't know whether Michael would address the fact that upon council, we've actually, actually asked council for advice to keep these as separate projects, which is the reason it's not going to the public. So I understand you don't like it necessarily, which is fine, but at the, at the end of the day, we did secure advice on this very question so that we would uh, be absolutely transparent. Um, these are separate projects, and they don't fall below that, that million dollar uh, threshold that we had put in place two years ago. So. Uh, you know, just want to make sure, and I don't know whether Michael wants to comment on it, but it clearly was, it's in the purview of the town council to be dealing with this question. And uh, I think that we've uh, done the appropriate thing by uh, running it by council. So, I don't know that Mike McGovern wants to, to reaffirm that, but uh, I'm pretty convinced that we're on, we're on sure footing as we, as we move forward. So, yeah, uh, through Chairman Ray. Yeah, it, it you know, I think if, if you look at the proposed vote, they're really four separate projects. You know, doing electrical work, you know, in a school has nothing to do with doing roof work. Uh, doing uh, the replacement of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning has nothing to do with roof. You know, if you look at the roofs, they're being done over two years. They're totally separate buildings. They're separate projects. And the charter specifically says a single project. Uh, it, it, in spending, it has nothing to do with bonding at all. If, if the, you know, the council under the charter has the responsibility to determine when it's appropriate to bond, the citizens have the responsibility under the charter to uh, determine, uh, you know, any project that's any single project that's over a million dollars. So, you know, th therefore, you know, I think you know somehow to say the citizens ought to vote on this would, would actually be a violation of the charter. And, and that's essentially what our attorney indicated. A bond council we reviewed this uh, almost a year ago when this bond was first proposed. Great. Thank you. Um, for, further through, um, through the chair, uh, when we started this capital um, planning process, um, we met with the school board, the full school board, school board, and we went through this initial $11 million. Um, and the conversations were quite substantive in terms of the detail around what was proposed. What did we learn? Who did we learn it from? And um, was it based on solid engineering? And um, our current chair was quite um, verbal about needing to have the facts and having it uh, substantiated with engineering study. So. There's been a, a pretty um, solid vetting process in terms of looking at each and every one of these projects as they pertain to whether they're needed or not. So I just want to make sure that, uh, that citizens, whether one citizen in the room or whether it's citizens at home watching us on television, that uh, this has been a very transparent prod, prod process that, that I firmly believe was the right thing to do and something that we determined as a community we needed to get our arms around what the next 10 years looks like. And uh, to just simply all of a sudden, you know, wind up with a, and this electrical system is kind of interesting because we had a failure uh, this year 
um, or the power going out at the, at the high school. And um, it's all part of the project that's supposedly being um, redone with the monies that are being asked for today. So again, just, uh, just for the record, just want to make sure that, uh, that folks understand that the vetting process has been rather complete. So. Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chairman. I did want to clarify, too, there's even, I think, some later information that Mr. Moore just gave. Uh, Scott Weinman, the school business manager, and I met with our financial advisor last week, and the true interest cost, interest rate, is now estimated at 2.34 percent over the, the 20 years, which would, you know, I think in the materials the council was just given, there was 825,000 in interest payment. The proposal, as it now stands, with that uh, interest cost, the cost for interest would be 445,000, or you know, substantially less than was indicated. We also you know, I, I want to emphasize that we, we have always, when we borrowed money, the, Mr. Gross mentioned about having paying more principal in later years. We have done just the opposite. We've, we've always had level principal payments in all of our bonds so that the highest cost is paid in the first year. And we've done that sort of for two reasons. One is an affordability test. If you can't afford it in the first year, you know, I, can you afford it? You, you don't want to set up long-term liabilities that, that balloon out in future years. I think other governments and other projects have done that to, to their, 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 their misfortune. Uh, so we, we've always had level principal payments that served us well. The other thing, as a result, with, with the, the debt service cost you know, in years that you don't borrow, always then goes down, goes down by several thousand, for instance. Here, the first year cost for principal and interest is estimated at 133245 It goes down to 128000 and then in the final year, it's only 87,000. So it's in keeping with that principle of being able to, if you can afford 133,000 in 2015, it's hoped in 2035, you can afford 87,000. Less is big deflation. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Um, question, um, Molly? Um, thank you, Mike Moore. And um, I'd like to ask the manager a question. And on that rate of three, uh, sorry, 2.34%, how long will that rate be valid for, not in terms of over the length of the bond, but between now and the time that we actually put that bond into service? It, Can we hold that rate? No. It, it's, it's put out to bid uh, on, on a day. We, I, we have a schedule. Uh, we'll be actually be getting prices in, I think, early March. Uh, we're awarding the bond sale is on March 3rd. So March 3rd is the date that we actually get the final interest cost. Uh, this is based on the current assumptions. And you know, we, as I mentioned in, in when I sent out this information last, last week, you know, interest rates are fairly low right now. And you know, we originally had thought about maybe trying to, to go on cash flow on the library project until a little bit later. But we really wanted to, to borrow the money sooner uh, because the interest rates are so low. And you know, it just you know, if it did go up, you know that that has big big effects long term. So uh, that's why you know we, we're proposing to have the bond sale on March third and actually get the proceeds on St. Patrick's Day, okay. March seventeenth. Great, thank you, Jamie. Yeah, I just want to reiterate what uh, Councilmember Walsh said that uh, for the public that we met with the school board in, uh, months ago now go through this process and we asked them many, many questions and we're satisfied with the answers. And then um, Finance Chair Michael Moore contacted each council member individually to see if we had any additional questions. Uh, the one question I asked him was whether or not anything had changed since we had met and he just, he replied that the interest rates had come down further so there was further savings. So uh, I'm just saying that I was satisfied with our back and forth. Other questions? Anyone else? Any other counselors? Yes? Yeah. I'd like to say that um, I, this also has been very well vetted, I think, and I'm particularly um, interested in the planning process because this is something that is fairly new on the part of the school board, at least since I've been on the council, and that is that they have a capital improvement plan. I, I mentioned last year that I was hoping there would be a five to ten year financial forecast. We in the municipal side have achieved that. 
I understand that you are working on that, and we'll be looking forward to that because I think that is a critical piece as well. I think the other part of this that I'm personally very excited about is that there seems to be in their, uh, there is in their proposal a concerted effort to then start budgeting on a much more careful basis in the future so that we don't have you know, uh, expectations of these, this type of money that we have to deal with. I mean, we do have buildings to maintain and all that, but I think it's very prudent, <clears throat> the efforts that, I, that we've seen to plan for budget in the future for, for these sorts of things. And so that's, that's very um, encouraging. So I'm planning to support the proposal. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay. So um, I guess we would move forward um, to look at that vote. Um, it's fairly lengthy, so I don't expect any. Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> I think so. Okay. Um, yes, I did. Okay. Um, so sure. moving forward, um, the proposal here, which is quite lengthy, and I don't expect anybody to read all of it out loud now. Um, but I would entertain a motion um, to approve um, the large proposal, large as in long, lengthy, excuse me. <coughs> Michael, just to, through the chair, Michael, do we have to read any specific part of this or? No, just if someone ought to move it as presented. Okay. Chair, Walsh. chair and Ray, I'd, I'd like to move um, this uh, proposal. Um, Item 19, 2015, as presented to the Town Council this evening. Thank you. Is there a second? Councillor uh, Jordan? Thank you. Discussion? No? Okay. Did you, I'm sorry. Just, just one comment again. Uh, this is a, another um, a prime example of um, of some of the good work by both the school board as well as the town council and staff in both uh, places. Um, it's work that, uh, that we all engaged in for the last several years and um, I'm, uh, I'm pleased to see it get to this point because I think that our citizens deserve to have a plan and understand what the costs are going forward. And um, I'm just pleased to see how this has all come together and the kind of cooperation and the give and take and the pushback and the, the sort of pressure testing of what it is that people are asking for is a, is a tribute to the hard work of, um, of a lot of, a lot of uh, good folks who care about our town and our citizens. And I thank you. Thank you. Oh, Council Wagner? Yeah, I just wanted to thank Mr. Gross for his comments and to encourage citizens to uh, participate early in the process and to, uh, in this case, they could send their emails to either the uh, town staff or to the school board members or the town councilors early on so that we could get that information and uh, help us in our deliberations. Great. Okay. Well, the item's been moved and seconded. Um, if there's nothing else, all in favor? Any opposed? No. It approves. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, moving on to item 20-2015, proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance for special event facilities. Um, is do this. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Wright. About uh, quite a few months ago, we had a discussion with the Spray Corporation regarding some facilities that they're using on their property for special events and uh, for weddings in particular, and it, it does not appear to be a permitted use in our ordinance. So we agreed to work together with them on developing an ordinance. Uh, we, we have a proposal uh, to, for the Council's consideration. Uh, it to, to what's recommended be referred to the Planning Board. And it, it looks at this whole issue of special event facilities and sets up a mechanism so that the Sprague's and other, other individuals who are similarly situated uh, in terms of larger lot sizes could still continue to have these special events on their property. Uh, but it's recommended this go to the, the planning board. This would go to the planning board under the 90-day rule, which uh, they, they would have three meetings in which to review it and report back to the council. 
And I know the Spray Corporation plans to engage with the Planning Board, should you refer this to them, to continue the dialogue and discussion. And you know, there will also be maps available for everyone to look at to see potentially uh, what else it might affect. Thank you, Michael. So is there a motion to um, refer the proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance to the Planning Board? Councillor Sullivan? Aye. So move. Thank you. Is there a second? Seconded. Councillor Walsh? Thank you. Questions? No? Okay. All in favor? Anyone opposed? No. Okay. Um, item 21-2015, annual acceptance of gifts. This is done once a year, as you most of you probably remember from last year. And there's a gift list in your packet. Um, and we uh, need to approve the acceptance of these gifts. So I will ask for a motion to accept the gifts. So moved. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. And is there a second? Thank you, Councillor McCausland. Um, <clears throat> any questions? No? Okay. All in favor? No opposed? Okay, great. Um, appointments Committee, item 22-2015. Uh, the Appointments Committee has a list of recommendations here. Mm -hmm. And I will turn this all over to Councillor Jordan uh, to give us the slate of potential um, Appointments Committee slate of appoint appointees. Yes, it is quite a slate. Um, we. <laughs> Well, uh, Ms. Councilor McCausland and I had a wonderful night interviewing several qualified applicants, and we wish we could have appointed everybody, but there's only so many openings around town. We encourage anybody who's not appointed tonight to continue to look for other opportunities as we'll be creating more committees later on tonight even. Um, so those that will be appointed, um, returning to the Board of Assessment Review is Michael Connell. Um, going on to the Conservation Commission is Jeremy Gabriel, G sorry, Gabrielson and Mark Fleming. The Fort Williams Advisory Committee will be gaining Suzanne McGinn, Joseph Kozlowski, and Chris Straw. The Personnel Appeals Board will be welcoming Jonathan Sarbeck and Leonard Cole. The Planning Board will be returning members Joseph Shallot and Peter Curry. The Recycling Committee will be gaining Jennifer McDonald and Tracy Floyd. The Riverside Memorial Cemetery Trustees is returning Gerald Sherry. The Thomas Memorial Library Trustees is returning Gail Brennan and Julia Bassett Sherwin. And the Zoning Board of Appeals is returning Josh Carver and gaining Stanley Wisniewski. Thank you, and did you wanna make a motion to accept oh. them? I make a motion to please accept the appointment committee's recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Jordan. Is there a second? Councillor McCausland. Great. Any questions? Councillor McCausland. I'll just make a quick comment. I'd like to say that we have discussed this internally on the council. We talked about it at our last workshop meeting. We've heard from a couple of citizens this year about engaging the public further in our um, request for input and participation in committees going on in town. I think we had tremendous turnout. We were really pleased and as uh, Councillor Jordan said, we spent a couple of long evenings interviewing people and I have to say we had um, not only great turnout but really enthusiastic turnout and very qualified folks applying and it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure working with Councillor Jordan and it was also a pleasure working with all the folks who came in to apply and as Caitlin said, I would also encourage people to um, keep applying. There are more openings coming up. Thanks. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Nope. Great. Ah, moving on to item 23-2015, Citizens Committee to Review municip Municipal Solid Waste and Recycling Options. Mr. McGovern, did you want to? Yes, Chairman Ray, as we discussed earlier this evening, uh, you know, we, we plan to have Wood and Kern do a short-term study of the, 
of the uh, recycling center. But we also need to look longer term, you know, where are we going with this, what major investments might we need to make, uh, you know, to, to get, to, to look, you know, out into the next couple of decades. So uh, this was originally due to happen after next July 1, uh, proposing we move it up. Uh, we, we, we don't have a full written proposal yet from Wooden Curran, so I'll, I'll be coming back at some point for the money to pay for the study. Uh, but in the short term, we'd like to get going on getting a committee together. Uh, to look at to look at the options that we're looking at to to run them by, it's proposed that the, the chair appoint the committee, uh, but that she also solicit uh, from the council, you know, any suggestions that you might have. Uh, it's proposed for five members. It could be seven. It's proposed for five. No magic to that. Uh, that one of the members be from the recycling committee. That one be from the council, and the, the rest from citizens at large. Uh, they'll seek. They're asked to seek citizen input. And they'll review recommendations from the engineering firm, look at long-term solutions for the handling of materials, and to submit a report to the council by June 30 of next year. Thank you, Michael. Um, so uh, we'd be looking for a motion to approve this. And at the same time, I'd also be interested uh, for which counselors might be interested in serving on this committee. Um, and then you can go from there. So. Is there a motion to um, accept the formation of the committee? Councillor Jordan? Well, I'd like to make a motion to accept it, but I'd like to amend it to five other citizens. Um, this is something I think is going to affect everybody in town, and I'd like to have a little more input from citizens at large than rather just three people. I, I think you're actually moving it with seven included, so it's really not an amendment, yeah. Well, it says three other citizens, yeah, one recycling committee. That's just a draft, so you're moving it that's, as if... Okay, it, so not amending, I'm just yeah. moving it as seven. With, yeah, with five citizens. With five citizens. Okay. Is there a second on Councillor Sullivan? Yes. All right. Um, discussion. Council McCausland. I'm confused. Uh, are we <laughs> saying there are now... We're proposing five or seven? Seven. Seven, seven. is the most. Seven total. This was just a staff draft. The councillor is moving seven, which is fine. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll throw my two cents on the table about that. Um, I don't disagree with you. I think it is helpful to have greater participation from the citizenry. <coughs> I will say, I think, in terms of the committee's work and its efficiency and process, um, obviously, dependent upon who the particular participants are, I think it's probably more efficient to have a smaller committee in the range of five rather than seven. But I'm open to argument in another direction. Well, you just come off of uh, uh, chairing a committee, and Jamie, you're obviously chaired the Fire and Range Committee as well, which was small, mm -hmm. and then also the Town Center Committee, which was a much larger <coughs> group. How, what's the feeling? Is there any... I'll respond to that. I think it was, again, very efficient to have five of us on the committee, and every meeting is open to the public and always includes an opportunity for public participation. So I, I think you have the benefit of having as much input as possible from as mm -hmm. much of the citizenry as possible, as long as people are interested in participating. But in terms of the committee work, and particularly given that we're looking for a turnaround by June, I think more efficient is probably better. And I think that means five rather than seven. Did, Jamie, did you want to respond? Yeah. Um, one of the problems with smaller committees is if you don't have a full complement for each meeting, then you might have three out of five there, four out of five there, and you, you might run the risk of not even having a quorum sometimes. But um, I, I think the fire range committee, there's sometimes that we didn't have all of us there. And that was true with the town center committee too, but if you're just missing one out of seven, it's not as big a, a deal. So I, I guess I lean more towards a seven member committee. Okay. Anybody else want to, oh, Councilor Jordan? Well, I just want to say, I, I mean, I still think seven is the, the better number. And the fact that it's a short time window, we're asking for them to turn around uh, recommendations by June. My fear is with few people, not everybody showing up maybe at every meeting, single viewpoints are going to be expressed and pushed forward into the recommendations versus a, a larger number of viewpoints in a short period of time. Okay. Councillor Sullivan. 
Well, one of the one of the pros of a, a, a five-member committee is it's generally easier to schedule your meetings. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, given the short time frame, that, that's something that the council ought to consider. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, the motion is for a seven member committee. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's what's on the table. I saw that. <laughs> yeah, that's what's on the table. <laughs> so we got to defeat the motion is for a that? seven member <laughs> committee. Yeah, I know. So, <laughs> so, so, so we have to, somebody has to propose an amendment to that. Or um, vote it down. Or yeah, vote, or vote it, it down. down so. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to ask for a vote on the seven member committee unless anybody wants to weigh in again still. No? Okay. All in favor of a seven member committee? All opposed? Okay. It fails. 4 3. Um, all right. Does, is there another motion? Council Sullivan. I move that we uh, appoint a five member committee. Okay. Is there a second? Councillor McCausland. Discussion? No. Okay. All in favor of a five member committee? Five, six, seven. <laughs> okay, fine. And a five member committee passes. All right. Did you want to say something? You looked like you wanted to add something. I, I wanted to ask a question about what the next step is then. Um, and my appointments committee. Address that? Yeah, the, the next step is for the council chair to appoint the committee. And as I indicated, we've had some discussions that if any council has any suggestions for citizens, uh, it would be good to let her know sooner rather than later. Yes. And, and she also entertained that she'd like to know counselors. Which counselors would be interested in being on the committee? Councilor Sullivan. Uh, uh, Chairman Ray, um, I'm the new liaison to the recycling committee. Uh -huh. I'd be very happy to serve on this special committee as okay. well. All right. Thank you. Anybody? <laughs> I see Councillor Walsh is giving yeah, me quite I, the know, look again, over there. It does, it, it, you know, it's to your decision, whatever decision is. I'm more than happy to as well. I think it's very important work and it needs to be done and done very well and quickly. Okay. And we need to use the, the resources that are being allocated through the engineering company to get this right. So, okay. so if Jessica wants to be the person, great. She'd like a, a backup if she can't be at a meeting. I'd be more than happy to, to do that. So. Okay, great. Well, Thank you. Well, Chairman Ray, if you, if you allow me, has two choices now. <laughs> You're going to make it difficult her, her for her to decide. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> welcome, to the, welcome to the world of chair. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. I think then if there's no more questions, we'll move forward. All right. Um, item 24-2015, <clears throat> update on the bottle shed, shed recycling program. Michael? Yeah, I'd like to point out that Jamie Garvin from the Recycling Committee is here, and I think a, pres a representative of the Lions Club again uh, on this particular issue. Uh, you know, as I mentioned last month, uh, we're looking at a different model effective January 1st, uh, that uh, this, the groups will no longer have to sponsor it to be there, which again is in keeping with all the other discussion, less congestion. Uh, the company will just come in and scoop up all the bottles and it'll be a committee that uh, would be formed uh, to, to divvy up, uh, to be appointed by the council to, to divvy up the uh, money amongst youth programs, which uh, doesn't just include school booster <coughs> things, but anything that really benefits the youth in the community, which continues to include the Lions Club because so much of what they do uh, benefits the youth in the community. Uh, the Recycling Committee has reviewed this and it, uh, deferred it. Uh, Jamie Garvin, if you'd like to comment on that. Okay. Did you want to make a comment? Sure. Thank you. I think he should be. Thank you, Councillors. Um, we're uh, over the past couple meetings, as you've seen reflected in our minutes, um, as well as some of our agenda, uh, have looked at the issue and advised um, uh, Director of Public Works <coughs> Malley on. Uh, what we really feel is an important thing uh, to continue with our recycling goals in terms of uh, providing the deposit return service, um, but have also seen through the realities of 
um, some of the private enterprise that sprung up in this arena, most specifically Clink, um, the uh, difficulty that it has caused in, in getting uh, uh, volunteer support at the bottle shed. Uh, I'm sure any of us have been there on any given uh, Saturday and seen uh, you know, bottles pouring out and things like that. Um, I'm also a parent in the community and can, from personal experience, attest to the fact that uh, the various youth sports programs and other school fundraising things that my children are involved in now involve handing you a clink bag with uh, a scan tag on it as opposed to getting you to sign up on the community calendar uh, for the bottle shed. So uh, what's very important and uh, glad that uh, th with the proposal that's uh, been put forward that all of the groups uh, that Town Manager McGovern referenced uh, will still be able to benefit from this important service, uh, most notably the Lions and Scouting organizations as opposed to simply just school groups. Um, but uh, as I said, we, we think it is important to continue on uh, uh, in order to maintain the strong recycling rates that we have, uh, and this effectively does that in a, in a more hopefully efficient uh, and well-maintained way. Um, we know that the vendor that will be providing the service has committed to an increased level of service for us, which we'll continue to monitor as a committee, along with the public work staff, um, and from there make a determination on, on the overall success. So thank you very much for the time. Thank you. So um, is there a motion to um, accept the new program for the bottle shed recycling? Councilor Sullivan? I so move. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilor McCausland? Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Councilor Walsh? Uh, maybe the question for Michael. Um, as we embark on looking at the recycling center and whether this, uh, the bottle shed component will be included or not included on the go forward basis, this vendor that we're going to do business with, is that a contractual arrangement for a couple of years? Is I, think, I think there's a one-year agreement that we have in place with, with this particular vendor. Okay. Just, just uh, don't want us to commit to something that may very, look very different a year from now or two years from now or five years from now. But bottom line is that's, that's good information to know it's just a year. Thank you. Councilor Jordan, excuse me. I was just curious what the cost is. I know, like, with Clink, it's 20 cents or when I did it a few years ago, it was 20 cents for a tag. What is, I mean, this vendor's got to be taking some percentage. Yeah, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but we're actually going to be getting more per bottle and can under this program than, we, than we're getting this month. We get more next month, but uh, I don't remember all the, the exact numbers, but so we, we get it on a bottle and can basis. Do you remember the numbers? Through the chair. Uh, so I don't remember the number specifically from the, the bid that um, uh, was reviewed and recommended. Um, what I do remember uh, specifically to your question about that so multiple bids were reviewed um, by uh, Bob Malley. And um, in addition to the cost associated with Clink, which was not as advantageous as going forward with Madden's, um, there was also a concern for ancillary um, potential residual effects of using clink uh, in terms of uh, people coming, uh, taking the bags, uh, and then putting their own sticker you know, on top, so essentially getting free bags that they would otherwise have to pay for uh, through retail distribution outlets. So this is a, a different model than what clink offers, um, and there was also a financial ad, you know, advantage to it as well. Any other questions? How do you make sure the vendor's not ripping you off? Um, that's a good question and probably one better directed to Bob. Um, number one, I would say that um, it's a longstanding relationship. I mean, they're the ones providing the service today. Um, so there's past, you know, past history working with them. That does not preclude, obviously, um, you know, any sort of underhanded dealings, I suppose. Um, but uh, I know that um, uh, over time, I mean, there, there's a, uh, you know, an average, um, you know, average amount and run rate basically that's been established. So if something were to deviate from that by a certain percentage, I'm sure that would certainly trigger, you know, trigger red flags. Um, we've seen pretty steady um, 
steady usage and participation at the bottle shed. Um, like I said, degrading a little bit um, in the last 12 months based on uh, you know, other available means to <coughs> dispose of um, uh, and return uh, deposit bottles. But um, there's, there's a seasonality to it. Obviously, there's months that are more advantageous than others in terms of volume. Um, but overall, it's it's you know fairly steady. So and anything like what you're suggesting would probably raise a red flag, uh, based on the deviation from the norm. There's pretty good historical data to 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 look at. Council McCausland, in terms of what the process looks like to the users in town, is it pretty much the same? You still drop off a bag of bottles? Yeah, so the, the discussions that have been taking place notwithstanding around any other changes to the facility, um, instead of there, so it'll actually be a more user-friendly setup uh, as we understand it. So uh, anyone who's volunteered in the bottle shed for any organization knows that it's a pretty tedious process of sorting. Here's the 12 ounce cans for beer, here's the 12 ounce cans for soda, so on down the line. Um, this will actually be a single sort model. So uh, rather than having to pre-sort anything, it'll just be all commingled, um, and they're just going to increase the amount of times that they pick up during a week, um, so that uh, you know there won't be the buildup, um, you know, within the shed. But there won't be all of the volunteer work to date is for all of that sorting, bagging, and storage, and there won't be a need for that anymore. So, but the user can drop off a, a bag of garbage bag of bottles, for example, or? Yeah, I, I think the specifics on that still remain to be seen whether or not there will be, I, I think there are going to be larger containment units that um, the idea would be if you were coming with a bag or some other kind of container, you might empty it into that. Um, not sure if you would actually just place the bag into the larger receptacle or not, um, but I, I think there's going to be several larger sort of containment units within the shed. And you're not anticipating that the users are having to do any sorting? No. Okay. That, that, that's definitely a, a um, user benefit now, is that um, not unlike where you put your mixed um, uh, recyclables in the silver bullets, you would do the same, you know, it would be a same sort of single sort system. That's great. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So, are we ready to vote? Yes. All right. All in favor? Any opposed? Nope. Okay. Um, moving on to item 25-2015, update of the personnel code. I'll turn this over to Michael for the, um, the overview. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, this would amend uh, personnel code to provide two, addif two additional options for uh, employee health insurance coverage. Right now, we have, a, we have a point of service plan and would be adding a, a PPO 500 plan and a PPO 2500 plan. And what those are are higher deductible plans that have lower premiums. So employees who, who are the low utilizers or, or intend to be the low utilizers could conceivably opt for these higher deductible plans. They would save money by their percentage of the premium that, that would be uh, less, we save money with our percentage of the premiums less. Uh, we, we, we also would have a health uh, uh, savings account, health reimbursement account, which would provide up to 70% of the cost of deductibles and co-pays. This is the trend in the industry uh, for health insurance is that, that people go to higher deductible plans. Uh, it's not mandatory. Uh, We'd begin this on March 1. There's quite a bit of training and uh, education involved, and a, you know, an option, a period in February where employees can opt for the new coverage. Initially, this would be offered to the Public Works employees, uh, part of the new collective bargaining agreement, and uh, to all of the non union employees. Uh, municipal, it would not be offered to the police employees <coughs> until their, their uh, collective bargaining agreement catches up with it. Uh, which would be next Jul July 1, and, and we negotiated uh, with them. There's also a slight change in, we also have a provision we save money in insurance that employees opt out, and that provision had provided that the employee saved 50% of the savings that we, we did 50%. We're proposing to, to change those to set amounts uh, in the agreement so that it doesn't automatically inflate every year at the same rate of, as the health insurance, and also because with, with all these different plans we're going to be offered, it's going to be that much more difficult to calculate what the savings is 
in terms of you know comparing what they would have been paying or the others because what option would they choose so the much cleaner system was to to move to this newer newer payout system and instead of paying them twice a year would actually pay them in each paycheck uh, which which is is just cleaner uh, than, than doing it twice a year a lot easier to track and figure out uh, what period they're in and some of those issues so I recommend that you adopt this amendment to the personnel code thank you Michael is there a motion Councillor Sullivan I move that we uh, update the personnel code as presented thank you is there a second second it thank you Councillor Walsh questions no okay then all in favor oh I'm sorry Council I, I just wanted to commend the council and the town manager <clears throat> for working very hard and long on this proposal and concept thank you anyone else Okay, all in favor? Any opposed? No? Okay. Moving on to item 26 to 15, appointment of registrar of voters. Um, our state law requires the municipal officers appoint a registrar of voters, and you have the section that applies to this. So um, do we actually... Do the person's name or? Yes, it's recommended that you appoint Deborah Lane. Okay, great. Um, so, is there a motion? Councilor Walsh. I move that we uh, reappoint Deborah M. Lane to serve as the Registrar of Voters for the term to expire January 1st, 2017. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilor Wagner? Is any discussion? Now's your chance to run. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we just did it. Two yeah, years ago. <laughs> exactly. Okay, all in favor? No opposed. I throw things around. Um, and let's see, is that the end of that? Ex citizens citizens discussions. Yep. Okay, so we're moving on to citizens' opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there anybody who would like to? Say anything to the council? Mm. Seeing none, um, I will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. I ju just Oops. did want to say something briefly. Certainly. If I can find my note. Just a reminder of the council, you have a workshop scheduled for uh, a date coming up. Mm -hmm. January, it's in these notes somewhere. January 5th, right? January 5th, that's what I thought. And one of the things on your, your agenda is going to be your council goals. We, we had a draft, and you know the draft's ready. It's actually included in with the materials for tonight's meeting. But uh, if anyone, you know, if everyone would look at that, and uh, on there will be an agenda going out for the January 5th meeting, and it will not only include looking at the goals one more time. Kathy and I had a meeting the other day, and I think we, we've picked four or five of them that will begin a more in-depth discussion as to what you think the next steps are in, in getting them moving. So that's January 5th. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So anybody else have anything else? No? Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Councillor Wagner. Is there a second? Councillor Walsh, all in favor? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Happy holidays.